Let's welcome in our co-host, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, two-star. Good morning, Rob. Spent the last 30 minutes listening to you and John Gale scrap. I don't know whether I should be crying or laughing. Why don't you just uh, lie down? We'll put a cold cloth on I, your head. I had been, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and I blame this on Maria because usually yeah. I would be going, yeah. uh, let's welcome in our second co-host, Maria Lawrence, an all-star. And uh, I can't do that today. She's not Cannot, a co-host. That's right. But yeah. I can bring in New York Times bestselling author, John Gilstrap. John, second string. <laughs> Second string. <laughs> Maria would say more than that. We got a uh, we got into a debate about how you pronounce Thanksgiving, where you put the accent on which syllable. Bill puts it on the first. I put it on the second. John, you're the tiebreaker. Thanksgiving second second syllable. Yeah. Bill accentuates the first. Yeah, one. yeah. That's I'll, where it should be. <clears throat> Thanks. <laughs> well, there's given. Well, actually, giving would yeah. is not a bad one either. No, but, you're right. You could, either one. This delay in in the playoffs. You're you're a coach, Rob. What does that do? Taking the emotions out of it, but just in terms of the physical training and all of that, taking a couple of weeks off. Does that have an impact on on the kids? Well, we won't know if it will be a couple of weeks. It, it could be if your bye, for instance, was the last week of the regular season. You could go two weeks without playing a game, and I think it does have an effect. But uh, if you're a highly seeded team, it's less of an effect because your game won't be as competitive, so it probably is less likely to affect you. But if you got a couple of evenly matched teams, whichever team adjusts yeah. best to the delay could have an advantage. How did this happen? Did someone saying, did someone take blame for making it, uh, this result? Well, really, I mean, they they moved 11 schools out of yeah. Quad yeah. A down to Triple A when they made up the determination and the rules of what makes up quad a those were kind of convoluted and then instead of having everybody agree when they moved the teams out in august of quad a down to triple a after the schedules had already been made and points and such would be affected by that they should have made the members all agree that this is the schedule that we are going to play by and everyone's satisfied with this if not let's get this worked out now in august yeah. and not in november so if there's some fault at that i think it probably goes around the SSAC says we're just enforcing the rules the principals made, and you can back up the mess from there, I guess. Passing the buck. Right. Yeah. Be a telephone to start our show today. Maria Lawrence, an all star, who will be on the phone in the first half hour. Maria, good morning. Good morning. I'm so sorry that I'm not there in person to offer all my expertise about the SSAC. So. Ooh, that is a terrible picture, Rob. Thank you. I'm trying to get another one. Woo! Well, I tried to tell you. I tried to tell you on the phone. I'm I'm, I'm trying to get you a new one, but um, the the time has passed. First so. of all, I, I I didn't say by the way that was a terrible picture. I said you probably want an updated picture. <laughs> Thank you. Your hair Thank is parted you. on is the side. It is a different hairdo side. for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Also, Nikki Biadrelli as well, the CEO of Hospice. Good morning, Nikki. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. Great to have you both with us. We have, of course, Bill Stubblefield, who's on the board and very much enjoys when you guys have those six, seven-hour meetings. <laughs> Nikki knows better than that. <laughs> Bill was telling me the other day, he goes, you know what I would really like around now is a seven-hour meeting in hospice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I've, I've, never, that, I've never said that, Nikki. I've never said that, <laughs> nor will I. What do, you guys, what do you guys do with Bill when he gets cranky there and when you have these meetings? Anything? Ignores me. <laughs> yeah, not at all. Not we put him right in the front row. You know, it's kind of like church. Or else put him right in the front row. Yeah. <laughs> put him in the front row, kind of like a church. That's great. Make him behave before the minister gives him a tongue lashing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but, excuse me, on that. Nikki does a very nice job of running a crisp, tight meeting. And so I applaud her. We uh, uh, wouldn't, don't have long meetings at hospice anymore. That's good. Yeah. Congratulations. Nikki, good job. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's talk about some of the things going on with hospice and palliative care. And as you get to the end of the year, any things that you want to make sure you make uh, that people are aware of? Go ahead, Nikki. Yeah, for sure. So first and foremost, most uh, November is an exciting month. It's National Hospice and Palliative Care Month. So I'm sure most of our community and our listeners here have hopefully heard about uh, National Hospice and Palliative Care Month, whether that's our Facebook page or um, articles in the journal, but really just an opportunity to highlight the care that we offer to the community, but also to salute our community members who have really trusted us um, and trusted in our care for the last 44 years. Um, you know, our mission really is just to, um, it's very simple, 
um, just to ensure that every one of our community members and their loved ones receive the highest quality of care and that care that's tailored to um, tailor to their needs and their family's needs. And so I'm just incredibly humbled and proud of the dedication and the teamwork um, from our staff members that they show and really just fostering that environment of hope and understanding in the work that we do, um, regardless of which program they experience our services from. Can you define palliative care? Sure, I'd be happy to. So palliative care is really, um, think of palliative care as care for advanced illness or serious illness. Um, these patients are not necessarily at the end. Um, this care is really meant for patients um, that face a chronic illness or face a serious illness and um, really receive that supportive care in their home setting. Our goal um, is to keep these patients out of the hospital, keep them in their homes. Um, I always like to tell people, think of this as your specialist service. So um, your cardiologist, your uh, maybe your kidney doctor, skin doctor, something like that. Um, a palliative care is really a specialty. And so we liken this service as kind of wraparound care. A lot of these patients that stay in palliative care often end up in hospice care. Um, but that could be, they could stay in the palliative program for a while. So, and I think too that um, that the people, uh, one of the things that we're emphasizing this month and as we move forward um, um, in the history of Hospice of the Panhandle, because as Nikki said, next year we'll be celebrating 45 years, but um, we are not just Hospice of the Panhandle anymore. And I think you'll certainly hear more about that as we move forward. But, you know, we offer, of course, hospice care, and as Nikki described, palliative care. So 200-plus patients on the hospice side, 300 patients on the palliative care side. We also have a very um, vibrant grief support program um, that's open to the whole community, not just people who have experienced a, a hospice loss. So I think that's one of the things that, we, that we're trying to message this month and moving forward, that we're not just, um, <clears throat> we're not just who, uh, we're not just your dad's hospice anymore, so mm -hmm. to speak. So We'll absolutely continue to have our core service um, of hospice but we absolutely look forward to growing um, and really just being able to expand our mission along the continuum of care and finding ways to have wraparound services to support people as people are aging and really want to stay in their homes. Um, you know, we'll always continue. Um, I, I pride ourselves on being a yes organization, whatever that looks like for someone, and continuing to provide excellent care in, in any of the programs that we provide. Yeah, uh, Nikki, people think of hospice, unfortunately, misconception is for the last day or last three or four days. Uh, that's obviously not the case. Hospice can provide services and provide relief, needed relief to a family long before that. Uh, would you speak to the uh, uh, how we can work around that misconception? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, um, I always call people or tell people to just call us and let us help you understand which program you best fit in. Um, but, you know, the less time people have in our hospice program, um, it's a little bit more difficult for them to get the full experience and benefit of the services that we offer. So one of the beautiful things about hospice care and the hospice benefit itself is that we get to provide this care um, on an interdisciplinary team approach, which means you're not just getting medical supportive services. You get support from a social worker, support from our physicians, support from nurses, support from an aide, um, support from our chaplain services. So um, there's a lot of misconception and really think hospice um, equals death. It's not so much about dying as it is um, how can we enhance the quality in the limited time that somebody has left? Is one something that we associate with disease? How does hospice address the pain element? How address the pain element? Yeah. Well, I would say um, there's many forms of pain, and so oftentimes people think all that we do is address physical pain, and so. Pain um, can be way more than that. We often see people experience um, 
emotional pain, spiritual distress. And that's, again, really leading back to the expertise of our interdisciplinary team to be able to sort through that. But I would say uh, from a physical pain aspect, um, we truly are the experts in end-of-life care. We have an incredibly qualified team, um, a board-certified geriatrician um, medical director who specializes in the ability to manage someone's pain and suffering um, at the end of life. And so that looks different for everybody. Um, and it looks different for each disease process. You know, there are times we're not able to get somebody's physical pain managed in the home care setting. They need a little bit more intensive care and that one-on-one -on -one care, which we are incredibly grateful because we have our 14-bed inpatient facility that sits on our beautiful campus here in Carnesville. that oftentimes patients that we can't get managed in the home, um, we're able to bring them to our inpatient facility here um, for several days to get them managed and on a better pain reg regimen to get back home. And I, I think that's one of the keys, too. Um, we recognize that, um, you know, 100% of uh, people in the community, at least that's our, our sense, want to be at home on those final months and days and, and hours. And, you know, so one of the one of the things we pride ourselves on is that we will provide um, we will provide the care wherever you call home. So if home is you know a house on West Ray Street, or if home is an area nursing home or assisted living, or if home is the Red Roof Inn, I mean we provide care where people are um, or the inpatient facility. So. Um, I think that's just really important to to emphasize, and and some of the some of the stories that I hear, um, you know, the the places where our staff goes, it doesn't matter. They just go in, do the work, take care of the patient, and importantly, really take care of the family too. I hear I Bill knows this, and he's heard me sort of harp on this. I've been here 16 years. One of the things I hear most often when I talk to groups in the community, people who've experienced hospice care, I had no idea what you do for families. Yeah. Um, and that, that just resonates again and again because, you know, I, I always tell people the best gift you can give to your loved one is to care for them at home if you're able um, and we can help with that. We can't provide 24-hour care with you. We can certainly be that resource, but you can do it. And, and that's what family members say all the time. I had no idea, but I could not have done it without the help of Hospice of the Panhandle. Yeah, this time of year is incredibly challenging, too, with the holidays quickly approaching. And I, you know, if I could just get one message out to the community this morning is let us help you um, keep your loved one home for the holidays. And, you know, let our team of experts come in to help you, um, to walk along beside you and guide you through that care so you can be home and your loved one can be home. Um, at this really important time of the year. Uh, this is John. Good morning. Uh, not to drag you into politics, but that's what I'm going to do. Uh, the, the legislature and the voters actually have taken a very strong stance on assisted suicide through Amendment 1 and through the existing laws and kind of tying the hands of future legislators on in, in terms of uh, future laws. And in my experience in Fire and Rescue Service, there is a there's a continuum uh, during the the final days, there's a continuum between um, pain management and assisted suicide. And are, does does that concern you at all that there's a zealotry in the future that that might impact what the um, the, the the hospice physicians and and nurses are involved with? Well, thanks for bringing that up, John. Um, we did have people both on our staff and in the community. And, you know, and family members who reached out to us about that amendment. And, um, you know, we did not take um, a position on the amendment per se. Um, you know, what we do here um, is we believe effectively take care 
of patients at the end of life. We do not, um, we do not uh, accelerate the process in any way. Um, uh, so, you know, we didn't feel like it would be appropriate to, to take a position on that. And, you know, the voters, um, they spoke. And, and I think, you know, we're always, you know, concerned about what might happen. We're also concerned about, you know, the whole Medicare benefit, um, that, that piece, because, you know, quite honestly, 95% of our patients are Medicare, Medicaid patients. So, you know, we're looking at that as well as many other um, uh, pieces as we move forward here. What are the Medicare restrictions on hospice? Uh, so first of all, the Medicare benefit has been around um, the, the same exact benefit for 42 years now, and that benefit um, really reads, um, should a patient have a prognosis of six months or less if the disease runs its normal course, um, they are qualified um, for hospice care. Uh, they have to be certified by a hospice medical director, um, basically attesting that they are eligible under that benefit. Um, you know, none of us have that crystal ball on that six months or less prognosis. We certainly have clinical indicators that kind of help guide us. I think our number one question that we get asked, um, you know, for me, I've done the work at the bedside as a clinician, and we still hear the same stories, is how much longer does somebody have? Obviously, that's not up to any of us. However, based on signs and symptoms that are, you know, we're assessing or seeing, we can typically put... Um, a, a clinical prognosis surrounding that, whether that's hours to days, days to weeks, weeks to months. Um, but really, that is aligned with the current hospice benefit. And John, just to answer your question maybe a, a little bit more, um, when a, a patient um, is eligible for hospice service, um, what the benefit provides is all of the medicines, all of the DME, so durable medical equipment like beds and walkers and wheelchairs, all of that, um, everything that's aligned um, with the terminal diagnosis, um, the hospice benefit pays for. So as you can imagine, um, and it's, it's really a managed care system, so right now, <laughs> as you can imagine, some days, um, it is very expensive to provide that care because in addition to all the medicines and durable medical, you know, you're, we're sending out nurses and aides and social workers and chaplains. Um, and, and it's our job to, um, to manage the, the, the daily fee, if you will, that we get um, from um, from the CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. I would just also add that I'm going to circle back to when I made the comment that we pride ourselves on being a yes organization. Medicare has told us year after year, we expect you to do more, but we're going to pay you less. So that includes more people services, paying for more things relative to the terminal diagnosis. And, you know, we wouldn't be able to continue to be that yes organization without the generosity and support from this community to kind of help us fill in the gap. Because that yes, when we're asking the question to patients and families, what's the most important thing we can do for you, that yes looks different for everybody. And so uh, oftentimes, I've told this story in the last year, um, yes, and the most important thing for a family may not be getting their physical or emotional pain under control, but they know they're not going to have one more Christmas and it's July with their family. So how do we come together as an organization, as a team in July to provide that family Christmas um, so they have that experience? You know, that that it's stories like that. Um, that I that I believe that really aren't written in the benefit, but absolutely matter to people as they face face diminished quantity of days. Nikki used the term team, and that team also includes volunteers. Absolutely. You have a large cadre of volunteers, do you not? Absolutely, we have close to 200 volunteers. Bill, um, I am very excited. To, uh, in the last uh, 45 days, we've had 20 new volunteers in training. I believe that's the most volunteers we've had in I don't know, probably close to 10 years. Um, join our organization. 
we're incredibly humbled and grateful, and we absolutely could not do the work without the support of the volunteers. And, and they do all kinds of things, like they sit on our board, as Bill does. Um, they put out, um, we posted a photo the other day. We have in front of our campus 158 American flags, which represent all of the veterans that we cared for over the past year um, who have passed away under our care. So we had two volunteers, one of whom is a veteran, who put those flags in the ground, um, uh, put lights on them so that you could see them at night. Um, so, and it runs the gamut, too. Then we have, we have volunteers who sit at the bedside. We have a really special group of volunteers called 11th Hour. Um, if a patient has no one with them, um, we believe that no one should die alone. Um, so our 11th Hour volunteers will go in and sit with the patient, read scripture, sing, um, just be a presence for them. And these people are available to our organization. You know, this is not um, a Tuesday afternoon at 2. These are people that we can call on um, at In any, the hour, of the night. any yeah. hour, middle of the night. We're about to run out of time, but very quickly, Light Up a Life is coming in a couple of three weeks. Yes, it is. That's, it's my favorite, um, selfishly, um, or, you know, fun, or thing we do every year for the community. And it's just an amazing way to for the community to get involved and remember a loved one, regardless if they have passed in our hospice program or not. Um, we do that in Morgan County and then here on our campus for Berkeley and Jefferson County residents in Hampshire County as well. Um, we have um, quite a few luminaries that we put out every single year, and it's not only um, just a very meaningful uh, way to remember your loved ones at the holiday, but it's absolutely beautiful as well. And December the 8th is that date here on our campus, 515-ish. Um, um, Bill has certainly taken part, but um, it's not quite Antietam. Um, but it kind of looks like that, um, and it is just overwhelming to see um, family members who come and um, and seek out. It's quite a quite an event. You have to. It's alphabetized. We can find the name of your loved one, um, and people find it very meaningful. Nikki and Maria, thank you very much. I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you for the work you're you doing. You're quite welcome. Hospice. Thank you for having us. Nikki Biadrelli, Maria Lawrenson, and uh, Maria in the guest role this morning, not the co-host role via telephone. There, this segment brought.